Mr. Desse, good morning. Good morning, Your Honor. Uh, my name is Louis Desse, um, an applicant uh, to the Bar of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, and I'll be representing myself this morning before this court. Um, basically, I have a number of uh, arguments to go over uh, related to this bar admission, and I'll go over as many of them as possible within the allowed amount of time. Um, the first argument that I'd like to go over is that it's the applicant's position that basically the bar admission process is actually should be regulated under the World Trade Organization and the General Agreement on Trade and Services Treaty that the United States has signed and confirmed. Um, the reason for that is that actually within this state, um, there are other members of even this state bar that are arguing that point in India now, um, basically attempting to get foreign lawyers registered under this treaty and also arguing that members of this bar should be allowed to practice in India. Um, it seems that it would create a problem under the treaty that we would have members of our bar in a foreign country arguing that they should open up their uh, legal uh, practice to our lawyers while at the same time we bar their lawyers <coughs> from our uh, system. Well, how does that affect you? You're um, not a foreign lawyer. No. However, under the uh, treaty provisions, it would seem that in order to properly uh, comply with the treaty provisions, and the WTO actually, and GATS even has a web page to list the various state uh, bar rules, that it would seem that it would mandate the regulation of the industry at the federal level and not on a state-by-state -state level, meaning that uh, the applicant um, in this case, and also in a similar case, uh, Strigler versus the bar examiners argued that in order to comply with the treaty is that the regulation of lawyers should be and has to be at the federal level, not at the state level. Um, the way that it would affect uh, the matter here is that it would mean that the Massachusetts Board of Bar Examiners um, would basically cease to exist by operation of federal law, and until such time Congress passed a federal regulatory system there would be basically no regulation of lawyers within the United States. Or any regulation would have to be done under the um, umbrella of the World Trade Organization and, the general, and to comply with the general agreement on trade and services. Well, does that mean that we would have to accept a canon law specialist from the Vatican in our courts? Uh, basically, uh, uh, um, complied with, uh, I would have to argue that yes since the Vatican is considered a, um, a member country, and if they were a signatory to the WTO, which I would actually have to check, I'm not actually sure on that. However, um, a parallel to your case is that there are some unusual members to the WTO. For example, Cuba and North Korea are actually signatories. So for example, if lawyers in those countries wish to practice in the United States, and in order to comply with WTO rules and the GATS Treaty, we would be obligated to uh, admit them to practice. And also the admission would have to be at the uh, basically nationwide, not just on a state by state level. Mr. Desi, it seems to me that as interesting as this argument is that this is not the appropriate forum to raise it. I mean, is there any indication that any federal court or the WTO has entertained any such notion? A at this time, no. However, the applicant believes that this case might actually provide such a forum. Basically, part of the applicant's argument here today is that the Massachusetts Board of Bar Examiners, the minute that the General Agreement on Trade and Services was signed and ratified, that they cease to exist by operational law at the federal level, and that they really have no standing here either as a party or to submit a report. Do you want to talk a little bit while you're, before you run out of time about these emails that were sent, which seem to have influenced the single justice to deny you the relief you sought? Well, again, they, they were uh, rather f inflammatory, threatening, coercive, and frankly unprofessional, were they not? Well, again, I, I've already gone over this in the testimony. Unfortunately, um, in, in, in the lead up to this, I had understood I was going to be given the standard 15 minutes, and in the scheduling, the for some reason that was only cut down to 10 minutes. Um, and, and again, so use the time you've got. Tell us. Um, well, again, but in presenting of the uh, arguments, I actually have a different order. I, I mean, if we have enough time, I will get to those. 
Um, in general, what I can say, however, under the standards enunciated for admission, uh, Prager, Hess, and in the matter of Allen, um, basically Prager was admitted to the bar um, even after importing 11 tons of marijuana. Uh, Hess was admitted to the bar of the Commonwealth even after being convicted of perjury um, while on trial for treason against the United States. And in the matter of Allen, he was admitted to the bar while he was still in jail for hiring an arsonist to burn down a building that he owned in which a homeless man was killed. Um, and, the, and again, the comparison that the applicant uh, gives is that all of these people were convicted of uh, felonies, whereas in this case, the applicant has not even been convicted of a misdemeanor. However, he's being treated far worse than these people. And basically, under due process and equal protection arguments under the United States Constitution, he, he would argue that the standards that were applied in those cases is not being applied here. Um, the next argument that the applicant would make is that under the state constitution, <coughs> under Article 30, that there's a separation of powers problem with having the Board of Bar Examiners under the judicial branch. Um, the problem that the, the applicant makes here is that basically this court is appointing the members of the board, um, and this is the only situation that the applicant's aware of where this um, would occur. In any other kind of case, whether it be civil or criminal, the parties would always be independent. If it was criminal, the, there would be a, a defendant and there would be the Commonwealth, which is actually their executive branch that would be pushing forward the case. Um, and in any a civil case, it would typically be two separate parties. But, but if the regulation of lawyers is within the province of the court, why is that a separation of powers? Um, the applicant would argue that actually the enabling legislation from 1897 on Mass General Law Chapter 221, Sections 35 and 36, is an unconstitutional delegation of executive branch authority to the judicial branch. I mean, other separation of power problems that are here is that the Board of Bar Examiners is taking pro bono legal work in order to push their, uh, to um, employ special counsels and basically bypassing legislative power of the uh, control of the purse strings under the Massachusetts State Constitution. Um, basically, at the federal level, this would be the anti-deficiency doctrine. Um, an example is that basically one of the bypasses on constitutional protections that's going on here is if the applicant feels that he's being treated unfairly by the Board of Bar Examiners, that he actually has, would have, with the power of the purse strings, a route of appeal to the state legislature and could request to them to defund the Board of Bar Examiners. However, by having the uh, pro bono special counsels, this um, constitutional power that the legislator have is being completely bypassed. Um, at the federal level, there are many presentations on the anti-deficiency doctrine. Um, the typical example that they'll have is, for example, a soldier will be riding along in a Jeep and it gets a flat tire. And then the question will be, can he accept uh, um, help or a volunteer to repair the tire. And at the federal level under anti-deficiency doctrine, the answer is no. And at first it seems, why would you have that? And the answer is, is if we allowed other people to just give goods and services to the government, thereby bypassing Congress's control of the purse strings, the problem then becomes, what happens if a wealthy person is giving all kinds of money, say, to a military unit or something? In an emergency, who would they follow? Would they follow the person giving them the money, or would they continue following Congress? And here at the state legislative level, we have the same problem. Um, we have a special counsel that actually conducted two investigations. Um, even though the, ag uh, the applicant protested the first one um, for these very... You have less than a minute. I wonder if you might return to Justice Graney's question about those emails. Well, again, I, I, you know, I explained I was under pressure. I explained that I was sorry. Um, I explained, you know, afterwards we exchanged additional emails, and, you know, they never indicated there was anything wrong. It was only 10 months later or more that they actually wrote a letter to the board, apparently after they didn't show up for small claims court, and then it was uh, additional time later that it was only after the applicant... Uh, finally passed the bar that he even uh, found out about the emails. Um, one of the interesting situations is at the same time 
that the applicant had been going through bar exams, he had also applied to take the one in Massachusetts. And the interesting situation that could have occurred is that the applicant could have passed New York, not passed Massachusetts, and would have had no idea that this had ever been done. Also, the applicant had uh, protested throughout the process that he wasn't allowed to confront uh, the other people involved in this. Thank you, Mr. Desi. Ms. Koski? You have 10 minutes. Thank you, Your Honor. May it please the Court, Katie Koski, on behalf of the Board of Bar Examiners, with, with me is my colleague, Jessica Gray. Pursuant to the rules of this Court, each applicant bears the burden of establishing that he possesses the requisite character, acquirements, and qualifications for admission to the Bar of the Commonwealth. Uh, by the rules of this Court, the Board of Bar Examiners is given the task when a, an applicant presents with some questions with respect to the, the, that applicant's character, the Board of Bar Examiners has been given the task of investigating uh, further. Here, the Board's report of non-qualification is premised upon a combination of factors which cast significant doubts on Mr. Dessie's moral character and fitness. The doubts have not been resolved to the Board's satisfaction. The single justice agreed with the Board's report of non-qualification, and I would submit that before this Court this morning, Mr. Dessie has failed again to address the issues with respect to his character and moral fitness to practice. The law of the Commonwealth under Prager is that any significant doubts about an applicant's character should be resolved in favor of protecting the public and by denying admission to the applicant. Uh, Mr. Desi applied originally to sit for the bar in December of 2003. Um, following his application, the, board, the Office of Bar Counsel received a letter from a member of the, the bar suggesting that Mr. Desi <coughs> would be coming up for to sit for the bar and that she uh, expressed concern about his ability to uh, be admitted. Uh, subsequently, Mr. Desi took and passed the February 2005 uh, bar exam and the board in, uh, joined both the letter from Ms. Omara Moore and the representations made on the applicant's application and determined that further review of his character and fitness to practice was necessary. Mr. Desi was um, brought in for an informal interview with the board. Uh, the board members at that interview were not satisfied that, that he was uh, qualified and enlisted special counsel to conduct an, a further investigation. Special counsel conducted that investigation. Ms. Co can yes, I just Judge. interrupt you? Absolutely. Um, the, the decision of the board to deny an applicant admission to the bar is a serious decision. And um, the applicant here says that the like cases to which he points, people have engaged in um, conduct which is far more egregious than he asserts the record su substantiates here. What is the board's response to that? I would agree with Mr. Desi that um, if any one of the factors that the board considered were, lo were looked at in a vacuum, then that one. Each, no, no one factor would have probably precluded and, and resulted in a, board, a board's report of non-qualification. It's the combination of these factors, in addition to Mr. Desi's behavior. And could you just, could you just list the factors for me? Absolutely. The first is uh, <coughs> a, a lack of financial responsibility. While in law school, um, oh, I believe it was in 2002, a year before he applied to for the first time to take the bar, Mr. Desi filed for a personal bankruptcy. But that by itself could never be a reason not to allow somebody admission, correct? That's absolutely the case. However, Mr. Desi has been given the opportunity since the filing of bankruptcy and since filing his application through the hearing process to establish that he has um, rectified his financial situation that led to the bankruptcy in 2002. He's not offered with the exception of offering that he's currently gainfully employed, he has not offered the board or the special counsel or the single justice with sufficient evidence to establish that he has uh, regained financial responsibility, if you will. And as the single justice found, financial, uh, financial matters do come to play in the practice of law, um, often in running, a, uh, running the business of practicing law, and that that is one aspect of the practice of law that is important. He has not met his burden of establishing that he has rehabilitated himself in that regard. 
another uh, combina or another factor that was considered by the board was his tendency to use litigation as a weapon uh, while in law school, and this uh, refers back to the emails that Justice Graney mentioned uh, when Mr. <coughs> Desi was before the court. Um, Mr. Desi served as a computer consultant for uh, AMF Technologies. He was in law school at the time. There was a, an undisputed invoice. AMF Technologies expressed their concern with their financial situation, asked to create a payment schedule to pay Mr. Desi for undisputed amounts of, for the computer consulting work. Uh, Mr. Desi apparently was not happy with the proposed payment schedule, and the, the uh, dispute escalated to the emails that are in the record where Mr. Desi used his knowledge of the law as a law student to make threats to the Omar Moore family to include not only uh, obtaining attachments on their personal property, but also threats of arresting members of the family who weren't involved in the business um, on Christmas and, and other sort of irrational uh, statements which were threatening. I, I take it your point is not so much uh, the use of litigation because it is surely perfectly permissible for somebody who has an, a, an acknowledged unpaid debt not to agree to a payment schedule and if the debt is not paid to resort to litigation. So in and of itself, that is not a problem. Right, and I don't think it's the actual uh, filing of a suit to collect for an undisputed debt. It's the use of um, or the perceived use of the legal system in a threatening manner. In other words, threats of arrest, threats of attachment, none of which uh, Mr. Desi admitted to special counsel, and it, it appears in the record, um, none of which were actually pursued by Mr. Desi. It was, it was more um, used as a means to, to threaten or to coerce the O'Mara Moore family rather than using the appropriate channels. Um, an additional factor that the, the board considered in its report for non-qualification is it Mr. Desi's tendency to blame others for the adversities that he has faced. And uh, an example of that would have been in the numerous uh, jobs that he had over the course of the short period of time. With respect to those, and, and I understand that um, he either left or was fired and he had explanations which nobody's <coughs> saying you had to believe, but the fact that his employers didn't provide any information as to the reason for his leaving. You c the absence of evidence doesn't, I mean, I'm just wondering where do you draw the inference that he tends to blame others when you have nothing from the other side? That's what I was a little concerned about. Um, I, I, each of the employers was contacted by special counsel and with your, in, just Foster, you're correct that with the exception of reporting that he had worked for a certain period of time, they didn't make further comment. Um, it's the board's understanding that that actually is common practice and we found that in other circumstances that employers have a tendency not to comment on uh, a former employee's employment. However, Mr. Desi had a pattern in a very short period of time of several jobs ending in what he explains as uh, what, what the board only could understand from Mr. Desi's own testimony as uh, questionable circumstances and that there was a series of these jobs over and over again. Um, and I will point out that with respect to his employment, although Mr. Desi has um, indicated that he was gainfully employed throughout the process and I believe remains gainfully employed now, he did not offer um, as a character witness any of the people for whom he's employed now to talk about his um, his employment, his, uh, he, he refers back to his service as a controller to relate to his financial responsibility. He did not bring in a witness, a character witness, to talk about that. The board was left, as you said, to infer based on the facts that were known to the board. Mr. Desi's burden is to establish that these um, somewhat negative uh, instances on their face either didn't happen or were somehow, uh, shouldn't negatively affect on his character, and the board did not was not satisfied that he met that burden. Um, would, you, would you agree that the cases of Prager and Hess and Allen are somewhat different in form because that was, you know, clear, you know, criminal conduct and there was, and we spoke in terms of rehabilitation. I mean, there was a, a tribunal that had made a determination and so the burden was on the um, petition at that stage to show that he, I think they were all he's, had had rehabilitated himself? Again, I think it all goes back to Mr. Desi's burden. 
Um, and in those cases, those applicants had satisfied the board and the, this court that they had rehabilitated themselves. Mr. Desi has not taken steps to establish that the problems that he has had in his past, including the emails, including financial irresponsibility, um, including a 209 order that was issued, all of those things taken together, he has not taken steps to satisfy the board or the single justice, or I would submit this court, that he has re rehabilitated himself. Those other instances, while those single issues may have been, may seem more egregious, um, those petitioners did satisfy the court and the board that they had rehabilitated I themselves. I, I, but you would know. I, I thought in one or more of them, the board had recommended admission and the court disagreed. Is that not so? I think that is the case with uh, Prager or Hiss, I believe or that's the case with. Okay. Thank you, uh, Ms. Koski. Thank you.